I want to introduce to you our guest speakers this morning, Dustin and Megan. Come on up, yeah. Some of you have been around a little while, remember Dustin, part of our staff several years ago, and then uh, the Lord called him to the mission field in 2007 in Asia, and Megan joined him in 2010, and now they have another little one on the way in February of 2014, so uh, time marches on, and we're delighted that you folks would include us in your itinerary, and so uh, you've already uh, clapped once, but would you join me in welcoming Dustin and Megan, our Free Methodist missionaries. Thank you. It's always a joy to be back, uh, to be back home here. Uh, it's, it, it, we were just discussing how long it's been since I was here on staff, and I uh, told Mark he hasn't aged one bit, although obviously uh, my life has gone on. His has, has just stayed just perfect. Would you, we want to look at a passage this morning, a, a story uh, of Jesus, and we want to unpack that a little bit, and we want to help you to see a little bit of uh, what we've seen, the way the Lord has used that in our life, and the way we see that playing out in the Middle East. If you turn to Matthew chapter 14 uh, and look at that with us this morning, we're going to share together, uh, and hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll be blessed. We live and work in areas of the world that are continually on the news. We facilitate church planting and leadership development in Egypt, Iraq, Israel, and Jordan. If you've watched the news, you know that Jordan remains an island of calm amidst surrounding conflict, whether that conflict is Iraq or Syria or Egypt or Gaza or Israel or Palestine. There is a storm raging in the Middle East, and it's unpredictable in its nature and who it's going to hit next, how long it's going to last. Yet we serve a God whose kingdom is at hand in the midst of these storms that are raging. And it is our privilege and our joy to be able to stand here today and to testify to what God is doing in the Middle East, to testify to our God who calls us, who comes to us in order to call us to him, to testify about our God whom the wind and the waves obey, and to share with you this morning stories that you never hear on the news. So we'll begin by reading Matthew 14, 22 through 33. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves, because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him, they cried out in fear, walking like they were terrified. It is a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and he began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. One thing, hold your Bibles open. We're going to take a, just a couple minutes and unpack this a little bit. One of, the, one of the things that we have to keep in mind as we begin to look at this passage is where this lays in the life of Jesus. Here we have Jesus, who, who as Matthew has been telling the story of Jesus, has begun to, to identify himself for who he is. The, the people began to come out early on in Matthew's story, and they began to realize that he was a very gifted teacher. 
He was a, a rabbi, a teacher that taught unlike any of the other religious leaders of his day. He taught as one with authority. And then as time kind of progresses, Matthew continues to tell the story, and they begin to realize that really he's, he's more than just a teacher. He's a miracle worker. His authority and his teaching was, was beginning, to, beginning to manifest itself into tangible things that were happening in Jesus' life. People were coming to him, and, and, and things were happening. We also have to keep in mind that this is uh, the, some of the worst time, in essence, of the, the Roman occupation of Israel. Here, this pagan Roman government who was, was ruling over what was once the, the, the Yahweh nation, of worshipers of Yahweh who had their own ability to make their own laws and to, to, to live life to the glory of God. Now, they were under this pagan authority that people were longing to overthrow this government. There were rumors along the, amongst the countryside. People were talking about, about, could this next revolt be the one that would overthrow Rome? Could we once again have our peace? And could we once again rule ourselves? What they were talking about, what the murmurs were about, was the hope that maybe the Messiah would come. Maybe the Messiah would be this great, this great military leader, this political leader that would overthrow Rome and once again reinstate our lives like we want them to be. They didn't have quite the same understanding of the Messiah as what we see in the story unfolding, as what we see Jesus had as we see God had in our story unfolding here. And so we, we have this type of an atmosphere, and, and, and Jesus is beginning to reveal himself in little ways, and the people are beginning to wonder, maybe this Jesus, this teacher, maybe he's the one who's the Messiah. Maybe he's the one that's going to overthrow Rome. And we see uh, the story that, that comes right before our story of the, the water walking is the, the feeding of the 5,000. Here, people have evidently come from miles and miles. We believe they've come as far as the Decapolis, which would be, the, you know, the part of Jordan, the northern part of Jordan, basically, where, where we live. People have walked for days to come to the north side of the Sea of Galilee to hear this rabbi. In essence, I think what's taken place here is almost the most anticlimactic point so far in the ministry of Jesus, because the, 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 the rumors have been spreading. People, the excitement has been raising. The, the, the disciples have been following him, hoping that maybe this would be the Messiah, the one that would make the big change. John tells us in the end of his story of the feeding of the 5,000 that clearly this was the point. The people were ready. They were ready to take him by force and make him their king. This is the point that the disciples had been longing and hoping for. But Jesus had a different idea. And so our story begins in probably one of the, the, the most disappointing atmospheres that the disciples have had so far. Here Jesus makes them get into a boat, and he, he sends them out into the sea to get away. He dismisses all of the crowds, people that had come from a far distance and, and wanted to make him their king. He sends them away. And he retreats up into the hills, up in the hills to get away from everyone. We know what he was doing. He went up to pray. We know that he was talking to his father, continuing to better understand the father's plan for how these people would come to know him as the Messiah. But the disciples didn't know that quite yet. They still didn't quite get it. They weren't quite sure what was going on. And so our story begins with what had to be 12 extremely disappointed disciples leaving, retreating out into the water. Now this is in one of our, I think the reason we, we chose this passage a long time ago as a couple to kind of wrestle through is because we just love the Sea of Galilee. It's, a, it's, it's not, we can see it literally from our house uh, about uh, two hours away. This is not a Sarah Palin comment, but about two hours away, not from our house, we can see the Sea of Galilee. Uh, it, it, it's a beautiful tropical oasis in this, this basin all around. The, the sea is about 7, 700 feet below sea level. The mountains around it are 2,000 to 4,000 feet above sea level. Dry, arid all around, and yet warm and tropical all around this water. 
birds from all over Europe and Africa will stop at this, what is actually only 13 miles by about seven miles wide lake. We're talking Higgins Lake here, not Lake Michigan. This, this beautiful little basin. We see our disciples have headed out into this, 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 uh, this lake. We assume they've headed out late at night or late in the evening, but probably before dark after the feeding of the 5,000. And yet, as our story begins, it's in the fourth watch. This is between three and six in the, at, at night, in the morning. In the darkest hour of night, what happens so often in, in the Sea of Galilee is a, a, a warm or cooler, I guess, uh, tropical, no, cooler, dry weather front will move across the mountains, and it will hit this warm tropical biosphere that's on the northern end uh, over the sea. And it will, in literally a few minutes, the weather will change, and, and the lake can begin to get kind of choppy, and a storm can brew up, and out of the middle of nowhere, you can find yourself in a storm. This isn't the first time we've seen this type of a storm in Matthew. Matthew chapter 8, Jesus, or uh, Matthew tells the story of a, a very, very similar storm in, with the exact same disciples in probably a very similar boat in almost the, probably almost the exact same area of the lake. There's a big difference, though, in that storm because in that storm, Jesus is with them. In that storm, Jesus calms the storm because he's with them and he takes care of them. This storm is different. Our, our story has begun and Jesus made the disciples. He made the disciples get into a boat and he sent them out into what turned out to be a storm. The disciples are disappointed. They're not sure what in the world Jesus is doing, but as we begin our, our story, they're, they're out in the middle of this storm because it's Jesus' fault, you know, that they're in the middle of this storm, and he's not with them. They now clearly know that they've been following one of the most, the most powerful person, probably is what they've realized by now. And he has put them in the middle of this storm. Matthew tells a story, and he, we don't know what the disciples said. I think probably so one of them had to have been screaming out, you know, this is Jesus' fault we're here. Where is Jesus? He's not here any longer with us. Whatever it was they were saying, they're in this storm, and Matthew just says Jesus came walking on the water out towards them. They, they, recognized, or they, they saw him, but they didn't recognize him. Uh, they were fearful of him. And then Jesus speaks. Look at this with me. Jesus says, be courageous. Then we, we, we read in our, our translation, it is I, do not fear. He says three things real clearly. One word uh, command, be courageous, he says. And then he says something else. If, you, if we look at it, it's true. He, he's revealing himself to say, it's me, it's Jesus. But if we look in the Greek as Matthew recorded it, he didn't just say, it's me. He said in, in the Greek, ego in me, literally translated, I am. Here's Jesus. The disciples are unsure. Who is this man they've been trying to follow after? Who is he? And here out on the water, Jesus says to them, I am. Where do we know this? We know this from the Old Testament. Who is God? God is the I am. When, when, when God manifests himself in the burning bush in front of Moses, what did he say? Moses said, who do I say sends me? God says, I am has sent you. God is the God who was, who is, and who is to come. Jesus, out in the midst of that storm, reveals himself not simply to be, it is me, Jesus, but I think a little bit more than that. He's beginning to reveal himself to be the Messiah, to be God himself incarnate. There's a lot we could do with this, but, but as, as Megan and I began to, to wrestle through this story, you know, we kind of live in an area where it's a little stormy. Uh, if you haven't watched the news, it, there's some big storms that are in process right now in our region. As we looked at this story, one of the, the biggest things that, that struck us as we got to this point and the story was the reality that God, the I am, is there in the presence of that storm. God reveals himself to us in life's storms. God is present with us in our storms, and he, he's calling to us, telling us, be courageous. I am is with you. 
do not fear. Well, the story kind of progresses, and it appears the disciples haven't quite caught it entirely. And so Peter kind of yells out, and he says, If it's really you, tell me to come out on the, on, on the water. There's a lot that we could look at here, but, but, but Matthew just kind of goes on, and he's, Matthew's the only one that records it this way or at all. He, he, Peter gets out of the boat when Jesus calls to him and says, Come. Begins to walk on water. Nobody, no man up until Jesus is ever recorded in Scripture ever walking on water. Jesus alone, who in essence is revealing himself to be God, and now Peter begins to step out, and begins to walk across the water. He begins to doubt. He begins to sink. Jesus reaches out his hand, pulls him up. And then Jesus makes an interesting comment. He says, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? If you've grown up in church, you've probably heard a few sermons on this verse alone. Interestingly, it's the same same thing Jesus says in, in Matthew 8 in the, in the first storm on the Sea of Galilee. And there's a lot of things, you know, obviously, I'm going to give you this. Obviously, Jesus is acknowledging that Peter doubted and that that was why he began to sink. But I, as, I, as I read through this and I began to think, what, what, what's he really getting at here? I began to wonder if maybe there's something a little bit more. How many disciples were in the boat, probably? Twelve, probably. How many disciples just walked on water? And he has little faith. Do you think maybe, what were the other eleven what, thinking at that point as they're sitting in the boat? The one with little faith just walked on water, something that only God is known to do. But then at the same time, what, what, what struck me with this verse is what is Jesus' teaching on faith? If you have faith as small as a you can move mountains. Jesus' teaching has never been to the disciples, if you have great faith, God will do great things through you. It's always been if you have small faith. In essence, what he's always said, if you have small faith put into action, if you have small faith which trusts in God, God will do what is truly unnatural through you. And then just real, real, real quickly, uh, Matthew just kind of ends the story, it seems like. He, he just says, and then they got back in the boat. Jesus calmed the storm. And he ends with an interesting phrase, and everyone in the boat worshipped him. This isn't just worshipped him as in praised him. This is worshipped him as in he was God. They recognized him for who he was. This word is not used of any disciple for a Jewish rabbi. This is the word that is used for disciples to their God. They worshipped him. Here we had 12 men in a boat in the middle of a storm. Jesus revealed himself to them, called them out, called one out into that storm. With small faith, God did what was unnatural with him, and the result was everybody in the boat believed. Everyone knew who God was because of what he'd done. We see this happening. Uh, I've never seen them walk on water. Though, I do think that we should put a rock in the Sea of Galilee just below sea level. Because I've always, every time I go, I want to stand out there and make it look like I've been walking on. We've never seen somebody walk on water, but we've seen God do some pretty amazing things. It's always struck me, it's always been people that are pretty simple people with pretty simple faith. Abu Ahmed is one of those guys. He's a Syrian who, uh, a Muslim, he was, he was uh, early on in the, in the war, he was taken captive as a prisoner of war. He was put in a military, uh, a regime prison. He was tortured literally to the point where they broke his back in about, about five different places in his back. His vertebrae were either severely damaged or, or, or had, were broken. He was paralyzed from the waist down and excruciating pain from the waist up. He was finally sent home when they decided that he, they had everything from him that they wanted, and he went home to his family who took him to a hospital. The hospital said, you have no money, therefore we can't really help you. We'll give you some drugs, and you can live out the rest of your life doped up on, on pain medicines to try and uh, take care of the pain, but you'll, you'll never walk without, with, you'll never walk or be able to move your legs without the necessary operations, but you can't afford them. Eventually, uh, as the war progressed, and this war seems to have no end in sight, his family decided they needed to get out of Syria. And so they managed somehow to have him transported. And they moved, a, uh, some other Syrians found a very, very dilapidated apartment not too far from our church building in Jordan. 
they moved into this apartment and with absolutely nothing, no money, no way to make any money, uh, no means, in essence, in what we would say their darkest hour, when life has basically come to an end, here they are. We have a, a, a ministry in our church that literally a team of, I think it's something where about 15 people almost full time, they just every morning go out five days a week visiting Syrians in their homes, helping deliver food packages and uh, all sorts of different aid type of products that we've been able to, to funnel through our ministry. One morning, one of the guys heard about, uh, heard about Abu Ahmed, and he went by to visit him, realizing that he had nothing. He did, a, like, one of our initial home visits. Realizing his family had nothing, he began to come back with some food boxes and then eventually helped him uh, get some basic things for their kitchen and their, get a new bed and some other things like that. And he continued to go back, and he just began to develop a friendship with him. Finally, Abu Ahmed says, you know, as they got to know each other, he said, why is it you do these things? You are a Christian, and I am a Muslim. You know, you, in other words, what he's saying is you don't have any social obligation to do what it is that you've done. Why do you do this? Began to share a little bit with him about where the motivation for his love comes from, about Jesus. And Abu Ahmed, who was familiar with the, the Muslim version of, of Jesus, of Isa, began to ask him, well, what do you understand Jesus to be? Who is Jesus to you? And my friend began to share with him and began to tell him a little bit more and eventually began to walk him through some of the, the Bible stories that we typically work through. And, you know, it's hard to tell Bible stories about Jesus to a paralyzed man before eventually you're going to get the question, does Jesus still heal paralyzed people? This young guy from our church, uh, he said, I have never seen God heal a paralyzed man. But I know what's true, and I know that God still does that. And so he said, not, probably just the Holy Spirit, but whatever it was, he said, yes, yes, for sure Jesus still does that, and I'll pray for you in Jesus' name that he does that. This young guy begins to pray for this, this, this very— given. I, I don't know if I mentioned— this is like one of the most intimidating Syrian men I've ever met. This is like Al-Qaeda-looking, big beard, no mustache— got mean written all over his face kind of guys. Here this young, this young believer from our, our church uh, would go regularly and pray with him in Jesus' name. They'd sit and they'd talk. He knew that something was happening here. It was obvious this guy wanted this, this, this something's going on. Keep doing this. And eventually Abu Ahmed began to, to tell him, he said, when you pray for me in Jesus' name, it's like there's a fire. A fire that just comes all over my body and it burns within me. Something's happening here. And he continues to do this, and over a matter of time, over a few weeks of praying for him, begins to realize that he has feeling once again in his legs, and the pain is beginning to subside, and he's beginning to move, and he gets to the point where he's able to sit up and begin to get around. And clearly, what the doctor said was impossible. He began to say, I know what's happening. Jesus is healing me. He began to meet with who this Jesus is. We always ask a few, three specific questions, and the final question after we tell a, a Bible story is, if this is true, who will you tell about this? He said, I know who I'm going to tell. There's another Syrian kid who was tortured as well in a prison, and he also was paralyzed, and I'm going to go tell him because he needs to know about this Jesus that heals that I've met. Working in the Middle East, we've heard story after story of Jesus encountering Muslims in the night through dreams and visions. But I had never known anybody with this experience until I met Fadia. Fadia came from a Muslim background family, though she probably was not devout in any way. She probably did not practice um, or know very much about her religion. She was born in Baghdad, and she was raised in an unstable home. Instead of the unconditional love that we're meant to experience in the home, Fadia was left empty, and she was desperate for affirmation and for affection. And by the young age of 14, she was engaged to be married. It was broken off because this man was an alcoholic, and it was clear that he would not be the one uh, to give her the unconditional love that she was looking for. So she graduated from high school, and found herself once again in a relationship with an older man. They were engaged, they were married, and they quickly had a son. But it was not long before brokenness consumed their marriage, and this man as well turned to alcohol. Once again, 
instability and brokenness filled Fadia's home, and she came up short of the unconditional love that she was looking for. One night, the abuse climaxed into an actual threat upon Fadia's life. Had it not been for her son's screaming, she probably would not have made it. Just in time, the door was opened, her husband was startled and fled, and that night, Fadia stayed with her Christian neighbor. And in the middle of the night, she had a dream, and a man dressed in all white came to her, extended his hand, and said, I am Jesus, follow me. Fadia tells us that the, the peace that she experienced that night in that man who extended his hand to her and that invitation was a peace that she had always, always longed for, but never, ever experienced. And she knew that for the sake of finding that peace in a long-lasting way, she was going to have to follow that man who she encountered, whose name is Jesus, no matter the cost. Fadia began asking who Jesus is and how to follow him. She began asking the evangelical community. She began searching the Bible and the Gospels. Ironically, as Fadia was finding eternal refuge, her earthly life was becoming more endangered. Not only was her husband trying to kill her, but she was now a Muslim who was wanting to follow Christ. And so in her situation, she was able to, with the help of the evangelical community, to flee that country that she was in and come to a different country. And because she was able to come to a new country where she knew no family, she, had, she just knew nobody, she was able to start over. And she was able to take a new name. While much of her identity, the fact that she's Muslim background, is unknown to many, most people, what they do know is that daily she is becoming whole in the unconditional love of God. She daily visits the homes of Syrian refugees, exhibiting an unusual joy as she herself is a refugee, a joy that is worthy of their question. Many in her boat, Syrian refugee women, Muslim background, are asking questions. And they're hearing about Jesus and the eternal refuge that he is offering. The cost of sharing could mean her life, she tells us. But the cost of not sharing is even greater. We don't know what your storm is. We don't know if the winds just started or if it's the fourth watch of the night and you are wondering where is Jesus? Is he with me? Maybe you're wondering like the disciples, why did he make me get in this boat in the first place? Maybe your, your storm is in a relationship in your home life, your marriage, your workplace. Maybe your storm is in your finances, uncertainty about future plans. Maybe it's an undefined health problem. Or maybe it's an explained health problem through a diagnosis that is unwanted. Maybe anxiety regarding any of these or more is a frequent storm in your life. Maybe you're in a season of loss and pain. And we want to encourage you today to take heart because Jesus is. And when you cry out from the depths of your heart asking, is he here? Is he with us? We pray that you, you would hear him say, I am. I am. Jesus is in your storm, and people are in your boat, and they're watching. They're watching how it is that you're going to recognize Jesus, and they're watching how it is you're going to respond when you do recognize him. So what will you do? Will you do what's natural? Will you cry out in fear? Will you stay in the boat? Will you let bitterness set in your dialogue with Jesus? Will you pretend you never heard him say, come? Or will you recognize Jesus' call to come as a call to do what is unnatural? 
Will you allow God's spirit to manifest his love and peace and joy in your home, in your marriage, in your workplace, when the only explanation is the power of the Holy Spirit? Will you dare to believe that Jesus is coming to you on the water? If you have not yet recognized him as being with you, will you dare to believe he's coming? And will you keep asking if it's him until you know that you've heard his voice and his call? Perhaps Jesus is calling you to let him cleanse you from self-interest, to let his love define you so completely that there is no room for any other definition of who you are. Perhaps he's asking you to make your surest, deepest attachment be to him, receiving him as your first love. Perhaps he's asking you to forsake all self-effort and fall into and rest in his mercy and grace. No matter what your storm is or what you're naturally inclined to do, the reality of Jesus being present with you is that you can hear his voice and you can be empowered to do what is unnatural. Jesus doesn't come to us simply to stop our storm. He comes to us in the midst of our storms to work a miracle in and through us so those in our boat will believe. He wants to do something in and through us so that others believe. He will call us out of a boat of complacency onto waters of trust, waters of praise, waters of intimacy. And those in our boat will be invited to join us in that place of worshiping him for who he is, for he alone is worthy. Twelve men were in a boat in the midst of a storm. Jesus revealed himself to them by the small faith of one man, stepped out, and God did a, something unnatural through him, and everyone there believed. I don't know what your storm is. I don't know what unnatural thing, what countercultural thing. I don't know what that is that God wants to do in and through you, but I know that there's people in your life that God wants to reveal himself to in and through you. Would you, can I pray? Father, would you just uh, continue to make your presence very evident with us, to us in the midst of the storm? Would you reveal yourself to us in a fresh way? Would you call to us, call that we would hear that word come? Would you give us the ability to put what faith we have into action? Would you do a big, unnatural thing through us? And would everybody around us come to know who you are because they've seen you in us? It's our simple prayer. Amen.